So the first talk, welcome to it. It's a serverless stack from database to application hosting, held by my wonderful colleague Timo, who has been with MongoDB for a good two years um, as a solution architect, so very, working very closely with a lot of customers who are also in the room today, um, and has been with Oracle before in a similar role. Um, so yeah, please. Look at the QR code as well that will be on the first screen, uh, which is for feedback. It will be on the last slide as well. So in the end or in the beginning, you can scan it and provide feedback for the session. That would be great. Um, and we will be have time for questions in the end of the talk. And now, please welcome to the stage Timo Lackmann. Thanks, Vanessa. All right, thanks. Oh, wow. It's really, really great to be here in Frankfurt having a dot .local now physically again. For me, it's a special pleasure because for me, it's a home play. I am actually from this area. So it is awesome to have this just in my backyard. Well, not with the cars, to be honest, but it's a nice location. So very happy to talk to you about serverless today. But first of all, maybe let me describe a bit of my tasks that I do as a solution architect. And one of my responsibilities when working with our customers is, of course, making sure that we appropriately size the MongoDB deployment they're gonna use for their workload, right? How I do that is, well, I have a more or less complex Excel sheet where I will try to estimate the data rows depending on the workload that customers have described. By that, trying to define the index sizes that we're gonna expect throughout the year, um, what data access pattern they have, so what workload they will have or need to have in cache, to provide the expected performance and so on. So it can be a quite complex process, right? To make sure that we get the appropriate sizing. However, I imagine your IT departments are not only responsible for running a database, I guess, right? You're responsible for the full application stack. And while sizing a database itself can already be quite complex, sizing a whole infrastructure for an application can be even more challenging. And for that reason, today I wanna introduce you to a serverless stack, how you actually can use MongoDB Atlas to use to build a, f a complete serverless stack from database to application hosting. And we're gonna start with um, the benefits of serverless, then we're gonna talk about how you can actually use MongoDB Atlas to build a serverless backend, and lastly, we will actually look at a real-world example. So, as I mentioned, sizing um, an infrastructure can be quite challenging. And why is that? Well, pretty simple. The needs might be quite unpredictable. Either you have user behavior that is hard to determine and how it will affect your sizing, or maybe you're even developing a completely new application and you don't have a point of reference on what to expect on the load, how the user will behave, and how that might influence the sizing of your infrastructure for the application. And what that will lead to is, of course, uh, more or less not so cost-efficient infrastructure because in the end, you will end up oversizing maybe a bit just to be sure that you at least get the performance that you're expecting. And of course, you wanna keep this impact as minimal as possible. So what you will end up probably doing is spend a lot of time monitoring the resource consumption. On the one hand side, making sure that you're not over-consuming the resource available so you can scale up in time, making sure that you don't lose any requests or whatever. On the other side, you wanna make sure you're not wasting or burning too much money on unused resources. And for that reason, serverless has been, or serverless solutions have been a more and more preferred approach to ease this pain. And why is that? Well, serverless, uh, serverless solutions do scale on demand instantly without you needing to do anything. And that's great, right? You don't need to monitor. Um, it will scale based on the amount of requests being processed, and you don't actually have to monitor anything. The other part is also that you have a usage-based pricing. So especially when I am start developing my application, or I've just recently introduced an application, I might not have too much workload, so I'm not paying for it as long as it's not used. On the other hand, when I'm paying for the workload, I can be sure it's actually for something productive. And lastly, serverless offerings do have a very ease of use aspect to them. I don't need to deploy an infrastructure, 
deploy my application hosting solution on it, um, need to make sure that I have all dependencies loaded and so on. No, usually I basically just upload my code, do whatever I want, and the whole environment, everything is taken care of. And for that very reason, you've just heard in the keynote that we have introduced Atlas serverless instances, which are GA since June this year. And with Atlas serverless instances, just to rephrase a bit what was already said in the keynote is of course you get an instance scalable MongoDB instance. So just to give you a point of reference, with MongoDB Atlas, you already have the capability for auto scaling, right? However, it's still based on infrastructure or on deployed infrastructure, meaning we will monitor the infrastructure, make sure if it's utilized or highly utilized to trigger and scale up process. However, that will need to create a new virtual machine, migrate it, you, your database to this new infrastructure, so it will take some time. Not with the Atlas serverless instances, this will happen instantly. And of course, you will have a, a consumption-based pricing, which does introduce discounts, so meaning the more you use the Atlas serverless instances, the less you pay per request. And lastly, it will be built on our reliable backend, it will be able, available or is available on all three cloud providers. You will always have the latest MongoDB version that is stable. We take care about backups, maintaining, um, releasing uh, or upgrading, patching, so nothing for you to actually take care at this point. And how do you actually get started with the Atlas Services instance? Well, pretty simple. There are four decisions you need to make. The first one is you need to choose your cloud provider and the location where you want to host your serverless instance. Because even so it's serverless, we still might have data sovereignty regulations or general GDPR and so on, so you can still control which region your data is stored. The third decision is which of the backup method is more suitable for your needs. And the last decision that is the hardest one is of course the name of your database that you're going to deploy. And that's basically it. With that, you have a fully functional MongoDB instance up and running within a minute. Great, thank you very much for my talk, that's it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I promise that we are not only talking about the database, right? I mentioned that we are gonna talk about the full stack. So, of course, the database is one part, and it's great that it's serverless and it can scale and everything, However, there's also the aspect of the application where actually all the magic happens that people want to use. And if we look a bit deeper into the aspects of the application that are interesting um, or an application needs to fulfill its three basic concepts. One, it needs to authenticate users and authorize users. So processing what kind of activities they're allowed to perform on the database, they need to be able to write data into the database, and ideally they would also be able to read data from the database. That is the core functionalities in a nutshell that I would say is the expectation towards an application layer. And how do we do that serverless on MongoDB Atlas? Well, not sure if all of you know this already, but in MongoDB Atlas we have something called app services, right? And app services actually allow us to implement application logic on a completely serverless infrastructure that is hosted by us, again, on all three cloud providers and is available, yeah, as mentioned, on AWS, Azure, and GCP. So this is actually an additional layer that we're providing for you to add more features and capabilities to your whole deployment on Atlas. Great, right? Having that on a PowerPoint, great. But how do I actually get started, right? How do I actually do that? Well, for that, I would say, let's actually dive into how you do it. So the first thing we're actually gonna look into is, you see the Atlas UI? I hope it's, I guess in the back it's a bit harder to read. Don't worry, it will get a bit easier with the next couple of slides. But the first thing is, we have now here the Atlas UI. Some of you might recognize it. We have our serverless instance already, our serverless Atlas instance already up and running. But now we're actually gonna look into this section there the app services. Show of hands, who has actually clicked on that button? Uh, that is not, there, that's not enough hands up there. Hopefully at the end of the talk today, we will all click there and have a look. With the app services, you actually start by 
creating a new application. As said, it's not an infrastructure that you deploy, but you, had, you define resources in these apps that you create. And once you create a new app, you basically have, again, to make very hard decisions. The first one is, again, a name, which I personally find the hardest one. If any of you have ever seen a demo I do, I'm not very creative. It's all called test. Don't recommend that for production systems. Then the next one is you're actually linking the application that you're deploying to an existing cluster. So what that means is with this, I'm telling that everything that I'm going to run in this application should work with a specific database. In my case, it's my serverless instance that I've already deployed. Could, of course, also be a dedicated or shared instance. And with that, it will take me to the apps UI. And I know it's overwhelming as the first look because there's a lot of great stuff you can do. Don't worry, I will take you through it step by step. And we will actually follow the sections here and we will start with the security parts. So we mentioned that with the application we need two things. We need to be able to authenticate user and we need to authorize them on what they're actually allowed to perform on the database. So let's start with the authentication part. MongoDB App Services actually provides an integration with a number of um, identity providers that you can use, like Google, Facebook, I'm not sure if that's something that might be interesting for your application, or if none of these are working for you or you want to integrate, for example, with your Active Directory, you know, you don't see Active Directory as a service provider here. However, you can just simply embed your own JSON web token and with that you can easily also integrate authentication via your Active Directory. In my demo, I'm gonna have a more simple approach. I'm gonna use the username password one and once I have enabled that one, it will also give me some configuration aspects like how do we, how do we want to confirm new users? How do we want to run the password reset process? And maybe to go back here for a minute, on the password recess process, you see a couple of options. And the interesting one is that selected there is run password reset function. So what is this function? Well, if we go further down the UI, it will actually show us what a function is. And a function is a way to run code on MongoDB Atlas in a serverless way. Similar how you would do it on AWS with Lambda or Azure Functions, same idea, right? Just that we run this code in Node.js, and here we could have a custom logic like checking certain parameters, resetting it to a default value, or whatever you want to do. In my case, I'm going to keep it simple, and I'm leaving the default value in there, which is an empty function that doesn't do anything. Fine enough for my uh, test run, at least. So the next thing I will do is actually create a user. As I mentioned, I'm going to use username and password, so I have a user created on Atlas App Services called Timo Lachmann at mycompany.com and have given it a password. So great. With that, I've taken care of authentication. The next step is, of course, authorizing users to actually do anything on the database. And for that, we're actually going to go into the rules section. And in the rules section, we will actually define on not only which collection users can access, but actually go even more granular on what documents and fields a user can read and write. And what does it look like? Well, in this, you can see I have said I will have a new collection or a new database called Local Frankfurt. It will have a collection 2022. And I'm giving all users read and write access to all documents and all fields in this collection. Of course, that is a first dry run, and that is a rule that you can easily create by default, so it's a nice and easy way to get started. Later on, you can, of course, create more complex ones where you say the document permission is based on the user ID that is passed by the authentication provider, making sure that a user only accessed a document that matched with his user ID, or only give it privileges to certain fields on the document. So, Later on, you can actually implement much more granular access rules for users. So with that, 
we have actually already achieved the first aspect that we talked about, right? Now we are able to authenticate users and we are able to authorize them on our database system. Now the next step is to actually enable the application then to write to our MongoDB instance. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna look into this section here which is called build. And in the build section you can actually already see a kind of password that you might know, right? GraphQL. So we are able to actually provide a GraphQL out of the box. Not sure if anyone, is anyone developing GraphQL APIs, endpoints? Yeah, I see a, a little bit, yeah. To be fair, it's a trend, but it's a trend that we see more and more growing. So we thought it's important to enable customers to utilize this new GraphQL endpoint um, trend that is more and more sophisticating in the market. So just keep in mind, if at any point you decide to switch to GraphQL endpoints, the implementation is already there and ready to be used. However, most of you are probably gonna use HTTPS endpoints and that's what we're gonna create. And once we go into there, we can actually see that we have two ways how we can connect to our MongoDB instance via HTTPS protocol. Either we can use um, a regular HTTPS endpoint where we will define the logic on the on the Atlas side, and the application will only call the API, maybe provide some payload, and receive a response. Or if you say, you know what, actually my application is quite capable of you know, creating a query and sending it to a database, the only thing is, I don't want to implement the whole, um, the whole driver in there, because for example, it's an edge device that actually can do HTTP call, uh, HTTPS calls, but cannot really implement a driver or something like this, great. For that, we have the data API. The data API will actually allow you to run aggregation um, queries against a REST API without the need to actually implement a driver. But for now, let's stick with the HTTPS endpoint. And once you click on create, you will enable it, you will give it a pass. So for example, we start with the write operation. So we're gonna call it write data. Um, and we will define what kind of request we're expecting, and if we're gonna give any response to our application back. You see, in my case, I'm very rude. I'm not telling the application if it was actually successful or giving any payload. You might wanna consider returning the document ID once you have successfully written, but you know what? We're gonna have the read section later on anyhow, and then we will return a bunch of data, so let's be lazy here and not return anything. Great, and what you can see here is I have the path that will be used, and how do I use that path? Well, below I also get my actual endpoint that I will then call from my application. And lastly, what am I expecting to return, and how do I need to make the call? Great, and then if you scroll further down the UI, you will see something that you've already seen with the user management, right? And that is providing a function that will define on what you're planning to execute on the Atlas side when an application is doing an API call. And again, we are creating a new function, and you can see this little code snippet, and that is basically all we need to do to write data to MongoDB. And what it is, is we're using the context object. That is an object that is available within app services that actually allows us to access the linked MongoDB instance without, you know, using a connection string and all these annoying stuff. We just use the, const, uh, the context, we say we want to connect to a MongoDB instance, and we give it the database and collection name as we, use, uh, as we are used to do it, and then we just simply run the insert one command, and we're gonna read the body payload and transform it into a JSON before writing it to the MongoDB instance. That's basically it. Now I have a REST endpoint that will allow me to write to MongoDB instance. No infrastructure needed, no complex coding. Was that simple? Yes, no, okay. <laughs> Good point, we will get to that one later. <laughs> but fair point. All right, so we're gonna do the same for our read data. This time, of course, we are nice. We are actually gonna return data, otherwise it's not really a read operation. And we're gonna give it a pass. 
And for the operation, we will say, yes, we're going to return data, and it's going to be of data type JSON. By the way, the eJSON is a representation of the binary JSON that is stored in MongoDB natively. Maybe if you are planning to use the driver to process the response of the API, you might be looking into using the eJSON, but usually JSON response are just fine. And then we're going to write a new function that will actually read data from our database system. And again, it's more or less a one-liner. We will, again, use a context service and run a find statement this, in this time, and we will just paste the query that it passed in the API call. Great. And with that, we have created two REST points that will allow us to read data from MongoDB, write data to MongoDB, and everything is running serverless on MongoDB Atlas without needing to deploy any additional resources and it will automatically scale with the amount of requests. That's simple. So looking at that, we basically have fulfilled all three criteria of an application, right? We're able to authenticate, authorize, read, and write. However, let's first see if it actually works, what we've done here. So again, we're going to use Postman to run a post command to our write API. And in my case, I have my document in a raw format in the body as a JSON. And I don't have any validation rules yet implemented in the function. That is, of course, something you might want to consider to have on the function part. If you don't do it on the database side with JSON validation, both are equally fine. And when I run this command, you can see I get a 200, uh, 204, so meaning, yes, the API call was successful, I just don't had, have any payload. And to see if it was actually successful, let's do the get command. So I will run the get command on the API. And just for you as a reference, because I'm using username and password to see how we do authentication, well, it's part of the uh, header of the he uh, request header where I provide the email address and password. And because I'm not providing any query statements, I'm basically finding all the documents that are in the database. And luckily enough, it's the same document that I've written before. Otherwise, I would be very worried. Great. Now we can say for sure that the endpoints are working. And we have a fully functional backend without needing to deploy anything uh, regarding infrastructure. However, there's, of course, the question, what is about the front, front end, right? We've talked about how to make data accessible. The next question is, how do I run my UI, my front end application that will actually give something to the users? Of course, you're always welcome to use different toolings that provide these kind of single page application or whatever you, you like to use. But let me open your mind to another idea here as well, because if you scroll down on the left side, we also have in this manage se section the hosting. And hosting is not referring to the app service hosting, but it actually offers you a service where you can just simply upload your file and have a single application hosting on MongoDB Atlas. So what you do is you click enable, you wait for a couple of seconds for it to be available, and then you upload, for example, your React Native code or whatever you have and implement it on your side, and then you have a fully functional application that has front end on MongoDB Atlas, back end on MongoDB Atlas, and database on MongoDB Atlas, and everything serverless and can scale with the growing demand of requests. So before I jump into the real world example, quick question, who knew everything that I told you today? Okay. Who learned something new? Okay, that's great. <laughs> so it actually had a purpose for me doing this talk. Now, let's actually look at a real world example. This is an application a colleague of mine has written, and he is a triathlon. Huge respect to him. I cannot do one, he does three at once. I don't understand it, but great for him. And he does a lot of training, and for that he used Strava. However, he's not really happy on how Strava represents this data and how they are visualized on the UI. So what he has built is the following. He has his 
own application hosted on MongoDB Atlas and has built an integration with the Strava um, system. So there are different APIs available there. And what happens is when Strava actually tracks an activity, it will trigger an event that will use the user authentication via API key to write into the existing serverless MongoDB instance. Great. Now he knows that the data has written something in, uh, that Strava has written something or tracked some activities and it will write it to MongoDB. However, the information that Strava delivers with this event is actually quite limited. So what he has done is he has added a database trigger that will actually listen to changes on the database side. And when it has recognized that a new data or that new data has been received, it will call another function. And that function will uh, call the Strava API to get more details on the tracked activity and write it into the MongoDB serverless instance. All running on MongoDB and it's fully functional. And it's something that he still uses today. And uh, it looks a little bit like this. So here he has his way of authenticating and you can see in his case, he actually integrated this with the Google um, authentication provider and when he logs in, he has this very nice dashboard that he built himself on React Native, where he can then track in more detail what he has trained and how much. Great, so I hope from this you have learned how you can actually do serverless. It doesn't need to be something complex. It doesn't have to take weeks or months to develop. It's very easy to implement on MongoDB Atlas. And with App Services, we're actually giving you all the tooling that you need to host a database on Atlas, but also to do the back end and the front end, everything on one platform. Great. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> and of course, feel free to leave a review of the presentation and your comments. Thank you very much, Timo. Amazing presentation, as always. Uh, we do have some time, not as much as we thought, uh, for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, let me bring you the mic, actually, because at the back, we don't really hear it. Hi, Timo. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, you mentioned scalability. Mm -hmm. What we are scaling here in the serverless and based on what? Well, actually, as a customer, you don't scale anything, right? It's us scaling in the background, making sure that we are able to fulfill all the requests that customers actually put in. And for that, we actually do have a very complex monitoring and scaling mechanism in the back end. So, um, but luckily as a customer, it doesn't really concern you. The only important thing is that you can be sure that your request will be processed in a timely manner. So you don't really scale anything. You just deploy your code and that's it. Uh, you mean uh, on the Atlas uh, serverless instance? Yeah, okay. So what do we actually do? Uh, let me uh, say it differently. What do we price on MongoDB serverless instances, right? Because that's also a question. We said it's use-based pricing, but what do we actually price? So we price the storage that you use. So how much data do you store? Uh, we price for the index size. And for each read and write operation, how much of the index is read? So if you do, a simple select where you only you know, scan one field, it's gonna be cheaper than if you do a whole uh, range co uh, scan, for example. And these are actually all parameters that you can extract from the MongoDB explain plan. So if you have workload already running on, let's say, a, a self-managed MongoDB, you can actually get all the required parameters from the explain plan to do some calculation if you wanna know how that will affect your pricing. Okay, great. Maybe one question that was there was the CICD Terraform integration. Very good question. Um, the following. So with MongoDB Atlas is a, in itself, we have been uh, a, Atlas, a, a Terraform provider for many years, and the same goes for the serverless instances, so you can just simply use Terraform to deploy the serverless instance as you do it with a dedicated cluster. For the app services, it's a bit different because for the app services, you want to do more complex stuff. 
right? You actually want to do code management because you saw the functions, right? And in reality, you're not going to use a UI to write the code. It's great for a first experience. It's horrible to do in production. So what we actually provide with the app services is a native integration into GitHub. So you can actually link your repository, and if you do any commit to the repository, it will automatically sync it to the app services so that you can actually you know, have a proper code management of your functions and implementation of REST APIs and what's on. So it's two solutions, right? It's Terraform on the one hand side, the other part is a GitHub integration. Um, the functions part is Node.js only. Yeah. yeah, can we do one more question? I'm looking at Vanessa, she's uh, the, the manager of the time, it's her if room. It is, uh, <laughs> very quick question, yes, but otherwise I know we have some more questions in the audience, which is amazing. Um, we do have to set up the next speaker though, but Timo will be walking around here all day, you know what he looks like now, so just find him and ask him later. <laughs> so let's take one more question um, in the back. Let me bring yeah, you the mic. Maybe the last question yeah, in the back. So now I, deploy, I develop my function local on my laptop and then I deploy it to the Mongo server. But how can I test and debug it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, fair point. So where you actually develop, yeah, you develop local, you would push it to GitHub, of course, and how you would do that is usually with having different apps, of course, for different staging, right? Um, and how you could migrate then from production to, or from a testing environment to production, there are actually different ways how you could do it, right? Either you have a repository-based separation between these, that would be one approach. Another one would be that actually um, a colleague of mine is using a lot, is using GitHub Actions. And then with GitHub Actions, he actually says, well, you know, first of all, I'm gonna de deploy my code to one GitHub repository that's gonna deploy on the app services test environment, then he can run his test, and if he's happy with the, with, the, with the result, he will actually have GitHub Actions to finally commit to a production uh, repository. So, yeah, for testing and development separation, I do recommend having separate app services and then having um, the automated deployment via GitHub integration with different repositories. The debugging part is, um, we do have logging um, on the app services. So there are actually extensive logs where you can look into what is the cause of, of certain errors. So there is a continuous monitoring and uh, logging available on the app services. Yeah. No, at the moment we do the debugging mostly on the UI with a, or on the logging mechanism of the app services. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, um, Timo. And thank you everyone for your attendance. If you have any questions, feel free to find him. He will have another talk as well uh, after lunch. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much.